Father, we are so grateful to you. Thank you for giving us another opportunity that to join, uh, come together to learn about you, Lord, especially Lord, as we are going to spend one hour of time uh, in learning your scripture and uh, discussing about it and spending time in fellowship with our brethren, Lord. I pray your leading may be granted to us and your spirit may take control over our conversation for everything that we do, Lord. We pray for your grace that we may not face any technical uh, uh, glitches, glitches uh, and the hour of our teaching session and learning may go smoothly. We want to hear your voice through your servant. Lead us and guide us. Help us open our hearts and minds that we may be able to understand you more. In a more in a more clear clear and better man in jesus name we pray amen amen, amen. Oh, to pass. okay we are going to continue now with uh the we believe series and uh what i'm actually going to do is i'm going to skip one section uh, we had finished section 8 on the sacraments and uh, section 9 actually deals with the church. And because we are going to be having a lecture series on the church, I felt that it will be best for me to wait for that to be over before we come back to the church because there may be more information that we can uh, share with you. So I am skipping section 9. And straight away going to section 10. So, Praveen, if you uh, keep those notes ready, uh, we will then move on to section 10. So, the section 10 is titled The Christian. And once again, uh, uh, as I was going through this, these uh, uh, the notes, I noticed that the uh, the, uh, uh, the the information that is given here is not very detailed. Uh, so we may need to we may need to pick up the subject again sometime later and bring in various things that may not have been discussed here. Also, the this particular section, the Christian does talk about some very important aspects, some very important uh, you know uh, points with regards to the behavior of a Christian and all of that. But then it has several questions on prayer and it goes through the what we normally call as the lord's prayer uh, a little bit more in detail so so the uh, just keep in mind that this particular section may need to be revisited with more information and which we can do down the line okay having said those few uh, words let me uh, dive straight into the uh, notes that we have, uh, section 10, and we will read the first question. The, uh, remember, the section is titled uh, The Christian. And it begins with the most uh, basic of questions What is a Christian? And this is what it says A Christian is any person who, in response to hearing the word of God, responds with faith in Jesus as God's eternal son, trusting in the grace freely given to us through his life, death on the cross, and resurrection to everlasting life. Recognizing Jesus as being their Lord and Savior, they turn to him in repentance and faith to receive salvation, including the gifts of forgiveness of sin and reconciliation with God. Submitting to the holy, loving Lordship of Christ, they no longer live for themselves, but for the praise and glory of God. They entrust their life to Jesus, transforming oversight, care, and service. So the basic question, what is a Christian? We have just read, but I want to pick up just a few important points. Uh, for us to note. Uh, it talks about 
you know, all that we will believe and trust in. But with the belief and the trust, what is important is the response. In, in, uh, it, it mentions that responding with faith in Jesus, of course, as God's eternal son. And then it moves on to say various other things. The response is very important. Uh, later down, uh, later in the, uh, down the, uh, the answers, it also mentions submitting to the holy, loving lordship of Christ. So a Christian uh, does sort of, um, uh, does have a set of beliefs, very important beliefs, but along with those beliefs comes a response. Uh, you cannot separate the two. Uh, a, a Christian, if you call a person a Christian, not only is, what do you call it, uh, distinguished by the belief system, but also the response. Uh, that is important. Um, now, what are we saying then? What we basically are saying is, a Christian is not uh, by physical birth. You may be born in a Christian family, but that does not necessarily make you a Christian as such. Uh, you have an advantage of knowing and having uh, will be exposed to a Christian way of life. But there is definitely a need for a, uh, a response, or rather a belief system and a response. Uh, those are uh, very important for us. Now, what is, it, what is it that we believe in? Well, to put it in, in a short way, there are many things we can say about our belief system. But basically speaking, recognizing the inclusion by and in Jesus or in Jesus by the Holy Spirit, okay? We are included by Jesus Christ in his humanity. Uh, and we like, we always say we can then move on, you know, to experience uh, ultimately his divinity. Uh, so these are some thoughts we need to keep in mind. But so that, that is the belief system in a very, very, you know, brief or, or uh, a, a, you know, a short way to explain it. But I also mentioned to you a response. Uh, the belief system is about Jesus, but accepting what Jesus did, did. That's the response. Now, one one important thing is this. Our response does not create the reality of reconciliation. Right? Uh, I think the Armenian thought, if some of you uh, know the Calvinistic Armenian debate, the Armenian thought tends to say that uh, it is our response that creates the reconciliation. Uh, we in the Trinitarian you know, tradition uh, will differ from that. What we say is that our response doesn't create the reconciliation. The reconciliation has already been created by Jesus in the Holy Spirit. All we are doing is accepting that reconciliation. So that's why the response is necessary. Because once again, we can go into free will, free choice. God made us free moral agents. We need to accept what has been freely given to us and all done by Jesus. So, uh, in short, there is a belief system in Jesus Christ and his inclusion by, you know, of all of us, all of humanity. But then the need for a response uh, to accept that reality. Let's not forget, we don't create that reality. We have no power to do so. It is created by Jesus. It is made real by Jesus. And all we do is accept it. One more thought before we leave this particular section, uh, this question. Um, in that response, we entrust our lives to Jesus transforming oversight, care and service. In other words, the response is 
manifested, expressed in a transformation. So there is a transformation that takes place as we respond, you say, like we say to the gospel, we respond to the love of Jesus. So that sort of validates our Christian experience uh, as we continue to remain in the embrace of Jesus. There is a transformation taking place. So what is a Christian? That's the question we are asking. We recognize there is a belief system which is called, you know, done by Jesus. There is a response to that. And in that response, there is a transformation taking place. So uh, those are some of the thoughts that we can take away from this particular point. Let's move to now the question, uh, question two in this section. Once again, for those, some of those who have just joined in, we are doing uh, section 10, the Christian. And uh, you may wonder why we have not done section nine, which is the church. I am going to postpone that till we finish our lecture series on the church, uh, because there, there might be much more you know, information that we can add to our discussion. So we have moved to section 10 and we are discussing the Christian. Question two reads, what happens when a person becomes a Christian? And the answer is they experience new birth through uh, the regeneration of the Holy Spirit, leading them to embrace their adoption as God's children. By the Holy Spirit, they share in the communion that the incarnate Son of God has with the Father, drawing them into right relationship with the triune God and fellow humans. So uh, this question, I think, is a spin-off from the first one, which we very briefly discussed. Remember the transformation that we talked about. So when the question asks what, what happens when a person becomes a Christian, it begins by saying they experience a new birth. Note, notice the experiential reality. Uh, and that is a new birth. In short, we can call it a transformation that takes place. Of course, the, a birth takes place, but then there is a growth process, which is the transformation that is taking place. Right? Uh, one very important thing is, once again, it ties up with that first question we asked. It also says, leading them to embrace their adoption as God's children. Notice what we are doing is, as we respond, we are embracing the adoption, or rather the adoption already made possible by Jesus Christ in the Holy Spirit. We don't create that adoption. We have no power to bring that adoption uh, to any kind of reality. The reality exists in Jesus and the Holy Spirit and all we are doing, we are invited into that adoption and all we are doing is embracing it. So once again, these are some of our, the way we will express it from a Trinitarian perspective. Okay. Uh, it also mentions, uh, maybe before I mention that, as we talk about a new birth, experiencing a new birth, embracing our adoption as God's children, what is the purpose for all of this? Where are we going with this? We are moving towards the ultimate goal, uh, which has been given to us in Christ, and that is maturity in Christ. As it says in Ephesians chapter 4, we are moving towards the the fullness of the maturity that we have, that we will have in Christ. In other words, conforming to the very image of Christ, we are going to have an experience and enjoy uh, the very humanity of Christ and finally and ultimately the glorified humanity of Christ. All right, so this is what happens when we become a Christian. And these are real you know, tangible things in one sense. It, it, it begins to affect our daily walk. One more thought I want to bring. It also mentions that we are being drawn into a right relationship with the triune God and our fellow humans, right? Now that's a very important point we cannot afford to miss. 
the very desire for us to connect with God, to commune with God, the very desire for us to see people as those we can have a relationship with on a higher plane, not just a physical, cognitive plane, but on a plane that is spiritual, is made possible because of uh, our adoption as God's children as we move and lead towards you know, the transformation that takes place. So what has happened? That question again reads, what happens when a person becomes a Christian? Well, we suddenly have a, a desire to commune with a transcendent God who is also imminent for us because he entered uh, our humanity. And we begin to see people in a way that God makes possible, that God enables in us. That relational dimension is very dynamic. Uh, it is a constant flowing river that, you know, like a river flowing that connects with God and with people and uh, begins to draw us into a very enjoyable, mature relationship, you know. So these are some of the thoughts that we can uh, uh, glean from the second point. We are going to now skip ten, uh, the third question and the fourth question. I forgot to mention that earlier. We are going to skip th the third and the fourth and we are going to go to the fifth. Uh, I'll tell you why, because it is a slight, uh, you know, it's actually, uh, I feel slightly out of place here. We need to discuss this maybe in another, in another platform, or another forum. Uh, so uh, we will just move away from three and four. You may read it yourself, but I think uh, we need to have a little bit more depth of discussion with regards to that and because they are very crucial. I'm not uh, minimizing its importance, but I feel they need to be dealt with perhaps a little bit more uh, in depth. So we will do that a little later. So let's go to then 10.5. Here the question in 10.5 is, how should a Christian treat non-Christians and people of other religions? Right, once again, this is a takeoff from question two. What happens when a person becomes a Christian? And so the obvious question to ask is, how do we treat other people uh, that we would think who are non-Christians or those who don't subscribe to the same faith that we do? Let's read the answer and then we will uh, uh, do some unpacking of it. The answer reads, as much as possible, we should meet friendship with friendship hostility with kindness, generosity with gratitude, persecution with forbearance, truth with agreement, and error with truth. We should express our faith with humility and devotion as the occasion requires, whether silently or openly, boldly or meekly, by word or by deed. On the other hand, we should avoid compromising the truth, but uh, on the other hand, we should not refuse to listen to or engage with those who disagree with us. In short, we should always welcome and accept those, or rather these others, in a way that honors and reflects the Lord's welcome and acceptance of us as his followers. So there is a lot mentioned there. Uh, let's uh, touch upon a few of those points. You know, in one sense, if you can use one word to uh, summarize all of these points mentioned, I'm sure you will be able to guess because that's the word we use from a Trinitarian perspective. Uh, we keep using that word uh, with much, much more greater clarity and understanding. And I'm sure you will, uh, if you said love, that is what it is. So how should a Christian treat non-Christians and people of other religions? Simply put, love, all right? Uh, because how did God treat us when we were dead in our sins? With love. How should we treat those who are still not 
uh, you know, uh, come to understanding and and respond to the understanding once again with love. Okay. Having mentioned that, um, like to just focus on uh, just a few words. It says we should express our faith with humility and devotion. I, and I want to particularly look at that word humility or maybe emphasize that. You know, many times what happens is, and I think we have done it, we are guilty of it, especially in our pre-reformation uh, period. And sometimes we see it today. And I think in one sense, as you look at the news from all over the world, and especially from particular countries, we begin to see that something is not right with the way Christians manifest their faith. Uh, it is not humility. We clearly have said here, we should express our faith with humility. But I see sometimes that uh, the expression of our faith has a sense of superiority. Putting down others, looking down upon others. And that is so unfortunate, which is not part of the gospel, which does not come from the gospel. Uh, or there is a sense of arrogance. Because we tend to say that, oh, I've got the truth and you don't have the truth. And hence it is uh, done with a sense of arrogance. Even when we talk to us, it is done with a sense of arrogance. And I think that has no place in the expression of our faith. You know, so the question reads, how should a Christian treat non-Christians and people of other religions with humility? course love which is expressed in humility once again look at Jesus when he walked the earth how did he treat those who were so-called sinners well he uh, he was found fault with the way he welcomed those who were outside so-called outsiders in fact he took uh, he took offense and he uh, corrected those, especially those who were supposedly religious leaders, uh, who did not treat people with the kind of humility, devotion, and love that God would have expected them to. Um, you know, one of the, I just wanted to mention this because on many occasions I've heard people use this word uh, and the word pagan. Sometimes we uh, refer to non-Christians as pagan. Now, I understand that the Bible uses that word. And I can also understand if it is used with a in, a in a technical sense. But sometimes it is used, or perhaps I should say most of the times it is used with uh, to undermine the other person. The word pagan is used to show that you are inferior. Or that the other person is inferior. And so the word pagan can sometimes be used in a very derogatory manner. And that is something, once again, I believe does not have place in the way a Christian expresses his faith. Uh, so I have stopped using that word pagan, even though it's biblical. Uh, but I have to be careful. And I think we are living in a world where we need to be sensitive to others. And when we understand and know what is their status in Christ, uh, you know, it does not endear them to us as a group of people, as a community of people, when we treat them in that particular manner. So my advice is, uh, my humble request is that we use such words with, uh, with great sensitivity. And uh, certainly not to put down other people. All right. Now, uh, it also mentions here that we should avoid compromising the truth. But on the other hand, we should not refuse to listen or to engage with those who disagree with us. Uh, those few words bring to my mind that we as Christians are, in one sense, a light to the world. 
we know that we have a mandate to take the gospel to the world. Uh, so the question is, how do we do that? Um, as it says here in the answer, we don't compromise the truth with the truth. So we must be able to provide the truth or, or uh, articulate the truth in a way that um, we don't compromise. But on the other hand, it says we should not refuse to listen or engage with those who disagree with us. So in other words, are we engaging with people in a manner, in a way that can promote a sense of understanding and which can lead to peace? You know, we, we recognize and respect their freedom of will to choose and to, uh, uh, and to decide even if they disagree with us. Um, but we never employ any kind of manipulation or resort to any kind of force to make them to come to our point of view or make them to believe. We don't do that. That is not how the gospel is to be preached to the others. Uh, we, yes, we don't compromise in telling the truth of the gospel. But on the other hand, it is not done through manipulation or force. And we don't want to have the label of, you know, trying to convert people with force. That is not what our uh, mandate is. Uh, but we try to promote understanding and peace, always respecting the other people's choice, freedom of will, and uh, the freedom to decide even as the Holy Spirit leads them. Let's not forget that we are not doing this on our own. We are not doing this by ourselves. It is also the participation of, we are rather we should say, I should say participating with the Holy Spirit in taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to the others. Don't minimize the role of the Holy Spirit. Don't think it is all up to you to convince. And that's when you think that way, then you begin to manipulate. And then you begin to do things that is wrong. And that I think must be understood and not be resorted to. So how should a Christian treat non-Christians and people of other religion? One more point I would mention, obviously, any things, any, any uh, attitudes or emotional dispositions such as casteism or racism or any kind of discrimination based on, you know, faith, is not part of our Christian vocation. It should not be adopted uh, as the way we express our faith. We do not discriminate, you know, based on any of these physical perspectives. And obviously, if I can refer you back to uh, Praveen's uh, message he gave, I think uh, two Sundays back, when he mentioned about this quite well, how do we treat other people? And I think uh, that fits in very well with what we are discussing. Okay, uh, let us just read one more and then we will stop for some discussion. All right, we are going to the sixth question. Why are Christians people of prayer? And the answer reads, prayer means calling upon God, whose spirit is always present with us, moving us to prayer. In prayer, we approach God with reverence, confidence, and humility. Prayer involves both addressing God in praise, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication, and listening for God's word within our hearts and minds, echoing his written word. Prayer brings us into communion with God. The more our lives are rooted in prayer, the more we sense how wonderful God is in grace, purity, majesty, and love. Prayer means offering our lives completely to God, submitting ourselves to God's will, and waiting faithfully for God's grace. Through prayer, God frees us from anxiety, equips us for service, and deepens our faith. Through prayer, our minds and hearts are being conformed to God's will and heart. All right, once again, I think uh, uh, it, uh, the answer captures so many uh, 
uh, nuances, so many aspects or, or, or you know, perspectives of prayer. Uh, but I just want to focus on one, once again, a thought that can sort of uh, uh, encapsulate all that is mentioned in the, uh, in the answer. And that is where it says prayer brings us into communion with God. And maybe I will just emphasize the fact that, you know, in any relationship, there is communication. Uh, in any, any sort of sense of communion and fellowship, there is communication. And we have the privilege of being able to address the very God of the universe. It brings us into communion with him. And as we communion, as we commune with the great God, all of these aspects comes in, you know, confession, thanksgiving, praise, clicking, listening, word within our hearts, and of course, through the written word, the scriptures. And so prayer obviously is something that is uh, important and regularly indulged in by a Christian. So if we are Christian, obviously prayer becomes very meaningful for us. It is because it's very meaningful for us from a Trinitarian perspective. We see that it is, a, it is relational. It is uh, fostering, building, and uh, enhancing a relationship. Mind you, it's not a ritual. And that is what sometimes we can reduce it to. If it becomes a ritual where we do it as though we are appeasing or checking off a checklist, then it loses its very purpose and meaning. Prayer for a Christian is relational because we are in a relationship and prayer enhances and deepens that relationship. And someday, of course, we will have the very blessing of being able to, uh, you know, commune with God, maybe face to face. I don't know what that would mean, how that would look. But today we do it, you know, in our own limitation, through our words, through our emotional disposition sometimes without words uh, but we definitely know that we are connecting with the very god of the universe and we are expecting for god to commune with us uh, responding to us in ways that sometimes we might not be able to fully explain prayer is submitting certainly to god's will and waiting on god and we have once again heard excellent sermons on waiting on God and uh, prayer is one way of waiting on God uh, and we know that it's a dynamic process once again God and the Holy Spirit connects with us connecting us with the with the Father much more can be said about that maybe we will uh, you know do uh, take these subjects and unpack them a little bit more uh, more fully down the line I'm going to stop there now and uh, I'd like to open it up for some discussion. Any thoughts that uh, Praveen would like to add? Franklin, Sachin, uh, lovely to see you both. Uh, and uh, anybody else have any questions? Feel free. We have about 20 minutes, which we can indulge in some discussion. Open to you. Mr. Rao, you have a question? You have to unmute yourself, Mr. Rao, don't forget. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. No, you said the prayer should not be a ritual. Yeah. Uh, uh, that means, suppose, uh, we normally, when we get up in the morning, uh, we pray and sometimes evening uh, then evening also before going to the bed if we pray yeah. uh, thanking God for the day 
is given as is it a ritual actually <laughs> the you have to answer the question <laughs> see if if you are doing it in a ritual i don't know what is it that you are how you are engaging with god but uh, if it is something said with any kind of emotional involvement or mental and intellectual involvement you are sort of saying it uh, without even meaning it i think it becomes a ritual so uh, but i'm not saying that if you pray in the morning and the night it becomes a ritual no i'm not saying that it is how you do it and why you do it and that answer to those questions only you can give i cannot <laughs> okay yeah not all right all right hello can i come in please yes yeah, shila good to hear you go ahead yeah what about uh, saying or reading prayers from my book is that a more uh, ritualistic way of praying or uh, <laughs> Would it be meaningful? I mean, if you are concentrating on what you are saying and uh, really thinking of God while you are reading that prayer from the book, is that okay? Uh, any thoughts on that? Uh, yes, I think uh, once again that's a very good question because so many of our liturgical churches they have written down prayers, uh, and I know there is a lot of you know. even prayers of a sinner uh and uh, you know various kinds of prayers actually written down now i feel that um, praying those prayers once again uh without any involvement of yourself into it can become ritualistic so i am not saying it is ritualistic you can pray the same prayer with tremendous amount of feeling and a sense of involvement with mm-hmm. the father son holy spirit you can mean every word as you read through those prayers uh so sometimes some people need help with prayer and these written down prayers can actually help for example we are reading uh, in the we believe series we are reading question and answers and as we read it is spurring thoughts and i feel that's very helpful for some people who are unable to or are, uh, you know for some reason are, are not able to articulate their prayers maybe a written prayer can be very helpful so i would only say that uh, once again it depends on how it is used it can become ritualistic uh now i'm not i'm not deriding the ritual uh i'm not saying just you know making it ritualistic can is a sin i'm not you know classifying it to such an ex- or making it such an extreme that it's a sin no but i would like to regain the very purpose of prayer and that is relation it has to have a relational component an element to it and that is what is important anybody else would like to add to those thoughts has it been useful ashila or did you still have a question on that no no i understand okay yes uh, franklin you had a thought unmute yourself franklin Sir, uh, I remember David used to pray three times in a day, sir, in the morning, in the noon, and in the night. Was it David or Daniel? Uh, da- uh, I, David also, I think, sir. Oh, well, probably, yeah. But I know Daniel did. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, I mean, once again, uh, you bring up another interesting point. I mean, uh, uh, should you pray morning, noon, and uh, night? Uh, you know uh, some people will say three times some people will say five times <laughs> shanti you have a thought on that go ahead yeah i wanted to uh, in order to answer to uh, mrs roach's uh, question um i think the prayer is all about the heart when we uh, when we speak to our father and we just speaking to him out of you know just because there are words then again it comes down to that particular verse also where you saying prayer is just not repeating words and babbling words 
and then even to a physical father when we come and we ask it's it's everything is about the heart isn't it we might be speaking the same words but if there is no heart the father recognizes it too there is no heart connection there i guess that that's what the lord when we say pray like for example ephesians 6:18 says to uh, mr popins as well in this and maybe and pray in the spirit i'm reading from ephesians 6:16 6:18 sorry uh pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests with this in mind be alert and always keep on praying so here it doesn't mention once twice or thrice or more than that. it says always so i guess it's about a lifestyle of prayer what a, a christian's life is about a lifestyle of prayer where you are able to offer up exaltation saying oh lord how wonderful you are when you when you cooking oh my this is this is in, incredible the, the way that somebody could put these vegetables and spices together and bring this up you know or for example oh lord today i am feeling down in my spirit you know things prayer at every point of time i guess uh, to be able to pray to have a heart to heart talk with our heavenly father and that is prayer and that is what i guess it says when when he saying uh, you know christians are known for prayer maybe also because of this because we don't pray rich, when it says ritualistically it's not about time it's not about how many words it's not about uh, how long prayers have you done or short prayers uh, you know or you know or somebody uh, or, or is it a prayer if people pray one hour sermon before the dining eating time you know that's that's not that so prayer is just a heart to heart talk and that is what the scriptures ask us and or rather encourage us to do in all sorts of prayers uh, whether it is praise exaltation supplication there are sometimes when people prayed without uttering words we have seen that too in the bible so i guess it's all about the heart and because the lord hears our words even before they are formed isn't it that's what the scripture says so prayer could even be a silent prayer not saying anything and yet the heavenly father so everything is to do with our heart good thoughts shanti i'm glad that you mentioned those but of course i don't want to make this uh, only all about prayer and we are talking about the christian and of course he regularly he and she regularly involves in prayer once again what helps me is to look at the relational component you know uh it is a way of relating with god and like you said shanti that when we look at it from a relational perspective there is no ceasing of prayer there is no point there is no point in time that i don't pray i am always connected with god i'm i'm you know even if i watch the news or read the newspaper i'm recognizing what the scripture might say or how jesus might look at it you know there is a constant communi- communing that's going on so Uh, that is where i think uh, a christian is more tuned to you know uh, to do that on a regular basis okay uh any other thoughts or questions that you might have um remember i mentioned we in 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 uh, uh question 5 uh, we asked how should a christian treat non christians and people of other religion and uh like i mentioned we see a range of expressions and if you see how some people treat non christians and the attitude they show uh is a very very in my understanding unbiblical uh, any thoughts on that uh, we as christians how is it that we you know uh, treat non christian uh, any thoughts on that because that is an expression of our faith that shows what we are in our hearts in fact it reveals our our you know uh, our religious disposition uh, you might remember the quotation of mahatma gandhi <laughs> he said that i like your christ but i don't like christians why did he say that because 
simply because of the way Christians behave and especially behave towards others. And that is so, so telling and so unfortunate. And I hope that, you know, we don't allow our, uh, you know, expressions to deny our faith or to, uh, to contradict our faith. I'd like to just get some thoughts from you if you have any. Anand. Anand, yes, we can hear you. Yes. Not only non Christians, within the Christian faith itself, with different denominations. Yes. Because my grandmother comes from a Pentecostal background. Yes. They yes. don't wear jewelry, they don't watch TV, they don't watch movies and all. Now, when they find others doing that, they outrightly condemn, condemn them. Sinners. You are sinners. This is what I have experienced. So it uh, makes us all the more to be very careful how we treat those who don't believe. Yes. Very good point, Anand. Uh, once again, it hits the nail on the head. And lots of lots to think about. We as Christians, when we can't treat our own, you know, in the way. Christ would want us to, how much, uh, you know, less we would do it to those who don't belong to the household of faith. Uh, very true. And uh, once again, I think a very bad testimony that we as Christians leave for the, for the world to see when there are fights. Just recently, I don't, I, I, I don't know if you have heard of this, but there is a major court case that has been going on for almost probably a hundred years. Yeah. This is between the Orthodox faction and the Jacobite faction of the Kerala church. There is a Kerala church which were the Jacobites, but they split and became the Orthodox and the, and the Jacobites. And now this split and they have gone, the court case has gone all the way to the Supreme Court. And you may have heard recently that the Supreme Court... Uh, uh, declared that all the properties will go to the, um, I think it's the Orthodox faction. And then a fight took place. The Jacobites didn't want to give up their properties. And then there has been violence, uh, you know, sit-ins, rioting, and all of these things taking place. What, uh, how unfortunate it is that we as Christians believe in this. And I think, I think Franklin, I told you, if you can do a little study on that, yeah, Franklin, you're on. Uh, you're, uh, you're on mute again. Can't hear you. Uh, Praveen, can you unmute him? Uh, he just, just a minute, sir. Sir, yes. can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Yes. Sir, in a nutshell, you have captured the uh, the story, sir. Okay. Now, the, now the, the, the million dollar question is that the Supreme Court orders are not being implemented by Christians. Right. Yes, maybe you want to study that further because... Oh, yes, surely, surely, sir. I'll, 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 do the, I'll, do, I'll do some lessons we can learn. Yeah. As you requested, I'll do a presentation, a right. short presentation. Because it might just help us yes. <laughs> to get some legal... But today the problem <laughs> is, sir, the Christian faction, one Christian faction, the Jacobites, are not honoring the uh, Supreme Court judgment. They are not right. upholding the laws of the land. Right. Very unfortunate. But um, this is the, I mean, what is the expression of our faith? You know, how do we express our faith? Unfortunately, we go expressing it in courts of laws of the land, which uh, once again uh, is, a, is a shame. It's to our own shame. Praveen, you had a thought? Yeah, just one minute. One minute. Oh, yeah, those are really good points. I'm just talking from a point of, uh, from a theological point of view. Uh, a person, uh, especially a Christian, who could not uh, 
treat other Christian well is a, is, is someone who did not recognize what does it mean to be a Christian. In other words, so, uh, if we could not treat a non-Christian as we treat ourselves, or if we could not treat uh, or value a non-Christian, or if we could not uh, see a non-Christian uh, of, of great value, we could not. We did okay. not understand our value. Mm -hmm. what, what I meant to say is the when we understand Christ's work, we cannot see the value of our personal. I mean, our personal mm -hmm. value only. We can really find the value of humanity. So, if we see, I am a Christian. I am better than the other person. That means you did not understand that you are a Christian. <laughs> what does it mean to become a Christian yet? What Christ has done for you, you did not understand yet. <coughs> if we understand that, we will really see a non-Christian as of with a great value. We see a non-Christian as a new creation in Christ, mm -hmm. somebody who are uh, for whom Christ died for, somebody who is of great value. That's what we would be able to find because we found the same value in us. If we could not find the same value in the others. We did not find our own value. We found ourselves as the worst people in the world. And that's why we are not able to treat others. There are a few things, I will, a few points I would like to bring to our notice, your notice. Number one, in the Old Testament, there was a command. The two great, one, of, one among the two great commandments. The first, I mean, the commandment is, love your neighbor as you love yourself. In Old Testament, there is no one who were able to fulfill that. And in the New Testament also, people were not able to fulfill that. Love as loving ourselves. Because we are not able to love ourselves. Because of that, we are not able to love others. We are not able to find worth in ourselves, value in ourselves. That's why we are not able to give value to others. That is the reason Jesus came and changed everything. And he didn't give the same commandment. Many a times we think there are two commandments Jesus has given. Jesus did not give two commandments. The two commandments mentioned in the Gospels, they are like a lawyer came and asked Jesus, what are the greatest commandments in the law? So he is answering the question. These two are the greatest commandments in the law. But he did not say you do away these two commandments. He gave one commandment which made... Uh, uh, which helped us to fulfill it. That is, love your brother as I have loved you. Here, when we understand how Christ has loved us, when we understand what is the value Christ has for us, we will be able to understand the value the, uh, of the person in front of us. And we will be able to value that person. So, if any Christian is not able to value the person outside or inside or anywhere, means the person did not understand his own value first. So that that strikes off the discussion, what, how do we treat non-Christian? If we could not treat a non-Christian as Christ treats us, we are not Christians at all, primary thing. We did not become the true, related to Christ. So it's all about finding the value in the, you know, in, in human, I mean, finding the value of humans in Christ, seeing everything in and through Christ. I guess that would help us. And we are not better than anyone. No Christian is better than non-Christian. All are standing at the same ground. That is at the foot of Jesus Christ. Non-Christians have to be saved by grace of Christ. And we are, we are saved by grace of Christ. And they are going to experience it by faith. And we are going to experience it by faith. There is no difference. And we are the people who are uh, by the help of the Holy Spirit, we, and uh, Galatians, it is written, uh, Galatians chapter 3, God has done all these things and offering it by faith so that nobody can boast in front of him. Abraham mm -hmm. cannot boast in front of him. And uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says, you are saved by grace through faith and it is not of yourself. Apostle Paul doesn't need to write that, but the, more, the reason he wrote it, because he might have seen Christians boasting about themselves because I could put my faith in Jesus. The other fellow could not put faith in Jesus. So what do we have to boast about ourselves? Is it our faith? No, even not our, even we cannot boast about our faith because it is the gift of God. So if we are not able to treat the other fellow with great value, 
that means we did not understand ourselves we did not even uh, become christian so at the fundamental level itself it will uh, it will what will you call uh, it uh, it is opposite to each other not treating other person and uh, having good value for ourselves i think that's a very good point uh, pravin uh, the new commandment jesus said the new commandment i give you uh, in one sense when it is a new commandment it supersedes all the others and uh, it's very interesting uh, like you mentioned loving others as jesus loved us so in other words the expression of our faith as a christian uh is the way we see jesus but what is it i mean if we we can if we see jesus as hating us then it is that's what we are doing to the others and so i think that's a very good point you brought up and once again i feel that is a very important aspect of the christian that is the section we are going through the christian the expression how does a christian express his faith and like we said in short we can use the word love and treating others treating our own people uh, reflects the way we treat ourselves i guess like pravin mentioned so the with that i think the time has just uh, gone by and uh, i just want to thank you all for joining us and uh, let's close then uh, in prayer if i can request uh, shanti if you can lead us in a closing prayer certainly let's bow in prayer holy eternal father god almighty thank you jesus thank you lord that you are always oh lord continuously speaking with us through your people through your word and through your spirit thank you lord god of jesus father we want to thank you for today's lesson a lot that you have uh, helped us learn a lot jesus and uh, remind ourselves a lot god our master who we are in you and why we are called to be the way that we are yes lord you have set us apart you've chosen us and you've set us apart a lot to be uh, an example a lot jesus for you lord as ambassadors for you Lord God our master we pray that you will give us the strength lord to um, to be like you more and more a lord jesus to love others like you did a lord jesus to forgive others like you did lord to care for others like you did jesus because you have died not one for one person but for the entire humanity father if you can love people like us people lord god our master uh, who we are not even uh qualified a lot jesus if you can love us a lot a master and we follow you and if we say we are your followers father uh, it becomes a prerogative for us a lot that we follow you jesus by loving others just as we love ourselves father god a master we pray that your holy spirit will continue to minister unto each one of us a lot about today today's lesson about the lifestyle of prayer a lot that we've learned father lord if there are areas in our lives a lord in, in regards to prayer and in regards to being a christian and loving others a lord jesus we pray that you will touch us at the point of your need that you'll help us understand even more a lord jesus what you are calling out for us to do thank you master god for everything for each one of them who are attending today lord we pray for your blessing for your help and and where they need oh lord jesus wherever they they require you father i pray that you'll touch them at the point of your need of their need oh lord jesus thank you once again and enable us a lot to meet soon again to praise and worship your name together as one in you oh lord in jesus name we pray this amen